Hello, Michael Fullylove here. In this episode of The Director's Chair, we're speaking with the ABC's Lee Sales about journalism, the United States, and why we just can't look away from Donald Trump. Two things really struck me in the time that I lived in America. The first was the longer I stayed, the less I felt I really understood about America, even though that's counterintuitive because obviously I was learning more all the time. But you just realise like it is a vast and deep country that is extremely different to Australia. I just think that there is an increasing trend um, towards opinion creeping into journalism across media organisations. And the kind of where it comes from, I guess, is this idea of, well, you know, this is the truth and so we should stand up for the truth. Well, well, actually, your job as a journalist is not to determine necessarily what the truth is. It's to present all of the available information to the public and to say, you make up your own mind. Welcome to the first episode of a new season of The Director's Chair, a Lowy Institute podcast. My name is Michael Fullylove and I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. On the director's chair, I sit down with political leaders, policymakers, and commentators to understand what's happening in the world. And there's a lot happening in the world at the moment. Wars in Europe and the Middle East, tensions in the South China Sea, and the looming possibility of Donald Trump's return to the White House and the retribution that he has promised will follow from that. The best way to approach a challenge is to be informed about it and so excellent journalism is more important than ever and in that spirit it's a pleasure for me that my first guest on this season of the Director's Chair is one of Australia's very best journalists, Lee Sales. Lee joined the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in 1995 and since then she's held many of the national broadcaster's most prominent roles including uh, Washington correspondent, national security correspondent, host of Late Line, host of 7.30, uh, and now host of Australian Story. She's also a best-selling and award-winning author. She's recently been on tour with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, and she's the co-host of a struggling little podcast called Chat 10 Looks 3. Lee, thank you for coming into Bly Street today to join me on the director's chair. How dare you malign my podcast in your opening remarks? Well, I'm actually hoping to borrow some of your <laughs> podcast listeners for my little podcast. Oh, so. it becomes clear why I've been invited to join the other luminaries who've appeared on this. Yeah. So, Lee, let me begin by declaring a conflict, and that is that you and I are mates. Yep. We met about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, actually, yes. in Washington, D.C., when you were the ABC's foreign correspondent. I had just finished completing the feasibility study for the Lowy Institute for Frank Lowy. I'd gone back to Oxford to write my PhD on FDR, and I was coming to Washington to do some research at the National Archives, and a mutual friend of ours recommended that I stay with you, and I felt a bit awkward <laughs> about introducing myself to, to a rando, but in, in fact, you were incredibly generous and you had me to come to stay with you. So ever, ever since there, we've been mates. And I've been trying to shed you ever since and sadly <laughs> have just been stuck with you. Um, no, it's true. And I, I remember our mutual friend said, um, look, my mate's coming through town. I think you'd get on quite well. And I was kind of rattling around by myself in this house in Washington. My husband was living in Philadelphia. And so I, I still can remember when, you know, you kind of showed up at the front door and I'm thinking, God, this complete stranger, am I mad? What if he turns out to be a nightmare? But I'd, I'd kind of banked on that you must be okay because of our, our mutual friend. And then we got on like a house on fire. All right. Now you weren't, you, you say you were rattling around the house, but you were very busy because yeah, yeah. it was an incredible period actually in American history because I arrived, I think in late 2002. So yeah. It was a year after 9-11. It was in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about your memories of that sort of feverish time in American history. I think people actually forget now how intense it was because it's so long ago. But in that immediate, I got there um, at the end of November, start of December 2001. And in fact, I'd applied for the job before 9-11. So it was, you know, you've got to think back to that era of the 90s, you've come through mostly, you know, the back half of the 90s dominated by the Clinton Lewinsky affair. And then suddenly it's just this drastically different environment. And so at that time, you know, you'd get on the 
metro in DC or the subway in New York and if the train stopped between stations you could literally sense the anxiety the airport security was just absolute peak craziness Every, everything was just heightened all the time because everyone at that time believed that another terror attack on that kind of a scale was probably going to be mm. you know imminent and happening mm. and so forth so it was very intense and then and very rapidly um after I got there, of course, there was um, the war in Afghanistan began, um, but also then attention turned fairly rapidly to Iraq and was the Bush administration going to invade Iraq? And so for about a quarter, I would say, of the first year that I was there, 2002, I was in New York at the United Nations as mm. the United States tried to see if they could get agreement around this. So it was a, it was a very interesting, exciting time to be US correspondent. Mm. And... You, you mentioned the build-up to the Iraq invasion in 2003. And, I mean, do you ever reflect back on the effects of the Iraq war and how it sort of echoed down through the ages? Because within a couple of years, it became clear that the United States had made a yeah. mistake in going to Iraq, yeah. not only because it didn't find the weapons of mass destruction, but because of the cost in blood and treasure and the opportunity cost and... Certainly when we look back on it now, I think it made our ally poorer and weaker and, and less respected and emboldened Iran. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you th it, it seems to me that it's one of those real discontinuities in history where the, the world really changed. A hundred percent. And also I feel like a lot of the way that debate unfolded with the polarisation around the views of whether the US should invade Iraq or not and the, and the attitudes towards the Bush administration, that kind of, um, you know, just polarisation politically um, and the way the public kind of split, that's continued to be kind of those really violent kind mm. of splits have continued to be evident. I mean, I always found it... Because I believe in, you know, fact, reason and logic and data and, you know, things of this nature, I always found it a very strange pivot because to me the core thing was always, and what I was always asking my reporting is, what does this have to do with 9-11? Mm. Um, and so I can understand Afghanistan because of the links to al-Qaeda, but I found it hard to understand how Iraq actually fit with that. But, you know, it, w one of my lasting memories of stories that I covered there was Tony Blair, when it was all just going disastrously, Tony Blair, the then British Prime Minister, came to address a sitting of both houses of Congress to persuade them to kind of stay the course and why it was important. And he did something that I feel also like is increasingly rare in the media and in, and in politics these days, which is he made this speech where he laid out this very persuasive case as to why it was important and, and why it had been the right decision and so forth. And, and he kind of argued using reason and logic to the degree that even though I myself had always kind of wondered, gee, how is this logical? He finished his speech and I thought, hmm, yeah, actually he, he might be right about that. And, how, you know, ask yourself these days, how often do you ever hear somebody deliver a speech or make a case mm. that causes you to reassess the way that you've analysed the facts or considered the issue mm. until that point? And that's always stuck with me, the power of that incredible address that he gave. I agree that I agree very much with you about Blair's incredible persuasive ability. Of course, that decision he made to go into Iraq was really the finish of, of yeah, Blair. Was. Yeah. Um, but I remember living through this myself because I was just starting a career as a think tanker. Yes. And unlike you, you, you weren't, I wasn't reporting it. I had to sort of start to make judgments about some of these issues. And you wrote a piece, I recall, for the International Herald Tribune about yeah, this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, a friend and I wrote a piece uh, saying that Australia shouldn't participate in the Iraq war um, for some of the reasons that you've mentioned, the strangeness of the pivot, but also just that Despite all the, uh, you know, all the uh, eloquence of Tony Blair, it just felt like if you squinted your eyes, this business of invading and occupying an Arab country wouldn't end well. Yeah. And uh, but I remember when we sent that piece off to the IHT, I think in early 2003, my finger really hesitated over the send button because I sort of felt like I'm betting against America by 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 pressing this, and I'm betting against Tony Blair, and oh. I'm betting and. And most of my mentors in the American system and the Australian system were supporting the war. We forget now 
that Absolutely. people like Democrats, like John Kerry, who was a Democratic nominee, Joe Biden supported the Iraq war. It was pretty broad support. Well, John Kerry's famous line, line in the 2004 election, well, I supported the war before I voted against it. Um, you know, the, the thing, again, that people forget is that if you questioned any policy directive of the Bush administration in that immediate, particularly 2002, but also going well into 2003, 2004, you were considered to be on the side of terrorists. Um, and, and you know, remember the French, the surrender, mm. the cheese-eating surrender monkeys, whatever mm. they were referred to. Um, and so... It, freedom fries. Freedom fries. It yeah. took quite a lot to question it because you were pretty much seen as a traitor and, and as a um, supporter of terrorists. The, the closest I've seen to that mentality again was during COVID where if you raised questions about lockdown, you were accused of being in favour of killing people. Mm. It, it was like all nuance disappeared. You mm. were either with us or you were against us. I think that was even Bush's actual mm. framing of, of um, what they were doing. And then what happened over time, of course, is as we learnt more about what happened, they made all these quite extreme decisions in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, um, detaining people without charge and, and, and extreme national security laws and so forth. And then over time, th those overreaches, which were kind of understandable in the, in the early days, they didn't wind them back and they didn't pull them back and a lot of it was done in secrecy. And so over time we learnt that there'd been these quite catastrophic decisions made that had had negative consequences that no one was kind of aware of at the time or if you dared question, you were accused of being a terrorist sympathiser. Mm, mm. uh, and also at the international level, I mean, when we look back on it, the invasion of Iraq in the absence of a Security Council resolution was a violation of the rules-based international order. Yep. And now 20 years ago, when we're using that language um, to in defence of Ukraine against Russia, yeah. I get lots of people on social media saying, but your country supported the, the invasion of Iraq. Yeah. So you have to remember that, you know, sometimes um, when you're very strong, as America was at that moment, it felt that it could do anything. But actually, yeah. in the long term, supporting... Supporting uh, the order, I think, is in the interests of the West, as, as the, in the interests of the strong as well as the weak. Yeah. Let me let me stay on the United States. Um, you 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 covered. Uh, you, I mean, you you travelled around the United States a lot. You yeah. went. You you did everything from uh, from the Iraq War to Hurricane Katrina. So yeah. all all the really exciting, <laughs> uplifting stories. And then the Academy Awards and all the kind of American fluff that you associate with that posting as well. Okay. Uh, well, we can talk about the Academy Awards another time, but but when when you were getting out into um, into the Rust Belt, into the suburbs, into the rural areas, um, tell us, did did you start to see the seeds of um, the dissatisfaction, the the loss of uh, the decline in working conditions that would lead members of the white working class over time? To, to go further and further to the right and end up in the camp of MAGA. hundred a hundred percent. And it, it's actually been one of the because I love America and so it's been a sad I've found it a sad thing to watch to go, God, this was so obvious that this where this was going and that people were being left behind and that there was discontent brewing and and you know that the people who traditionally looked after the white working class, um, being the Democrat Party, kind of didn't weren't attuned to, you know, some of, of what was going on, free trade and so forth and the effects of free trade. I mean, the thing that two things really struck me in the time that I lived in America. The first was the longer I stayed the less I felt I really understood about America, even though that's counterintuitive because obviously I was learning more all the time. But you just realise, like, it is a vast and deep country that is extremely different to Australia. And I think Australians underestimate how different America is because we speak the same language, we have a close mm. alliance and so forth. Um, we think because we've lived our life in proximity to a television set and watched, consumed a lot of American culture <laughs> that we understand America. And actually, the longer I was there, the more I felt like, gee, this is a really drastically different country to Australia. Um, and then the other thing, actually, over time, that, as you mentioned, like, the extent of travel I did... I, I actually was amazed that America through its history had managed to stay as one country because mm. you'd meet people in Vermont who would have just absolutely nothing in common with people that you would meet in Louisiana or people in California that would be drastically different to people in Ohio. But the thing that I found incredibly inspiring was, and, it, and this was the case whether they were kind of new migrants or people who'd been come on the Mayflower um, or the, whose family had come on the Mayflower, um, they had 
a very strong sense of what it meant to be an American and what American values were and so mm. forth. So what tied all these people together was this very strong sense of we're Americans. And of course, that was very pronounced as well in the post 9-11 era so even though the country kind of you know bush was a polarizing figure there was still this very strong sense that we're all in this together and this is what it means to be an american and i, I mean i haven't lived there obviously now for you know almost two decades i've been back obviously but i do wonder whether there's that still that strong sense of you know unity about what it means to be an american or not and that we're all in this together i'm, I'm just i'm not sure mm. but it, but to get back sorry to your question um yeah we were in the 2004 presidential election which which was Bush versus Kerry, which at the time, of course, I found massively exciting to be covering mm. a presidential election. Now, mm. now it seems like possibly the most boring US presidential election mm. going back to maybe the 1960s. Boring is not necessarily bad, but exactly. Yeah. Um, but that was fascinating because you got we're going to like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, classic swing states, and particularly I remember being in Ohio and talking to a guy who was a union organizer, and it, there was a, it was a classic town where you know granddad had worked in the local industry, dad had worked there, they'd had good jobs, the family's kind of affluence had improved all the time, and then suddenly. 2004 election, things were starting to bite with the economy and that we were having also, it was the era of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, mm. and you know, we were start to disco discover over time the extent of kind of, um, you know, corporate mm. corruption and so forth. And so average Americans were starting to find actually life's getting a bit harder and, and we were told that like this free trade stuff would actually improve our lives but turns out now this our, our local town business has moved offshore and it's gone to China or it's gone to Mexico or they're bringing in workers or whatever was going on and people felt like oh our lives are getting harder not easier and so this was what it turned into short term and again you know i think people forget because it's so long ago it was the tea party movement mm, mm. fostered by people like glenn beck on mm. on fox news and so forth and, and sarah palin mm. and it became the figurehead of it and, and all of that kind of thing and so these forces that you saw kick in are the things that have really come to fruition now with with mm. trump's rise mm. so a lot of these issues are coming up for decision again in another election that will not be the most boring election <laughs> no. since the 1960s. No, it um, makes you wish for a boring one, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, let me ask you about Biden and Trump as media performers, because mm -hmm. as a foreign pol policy analyst, I would say that Biden has been really an excellent president, a very basically a very strong foreign policy president, good for Australia in many Which ways. Which you'd expect because of his length of his experience in foreign policy. Yeah, all that stuff, great team around him. But, but... Um, he looks his age. Mm. Um, Trump is only, I think, four years younger. Uh, he's got he's carrying a lot more weight, but somehow he looks a lot more vital. Mm. But also, he's just so watchable. In fact, it's uh, you know it, it's very hard to look away from Donald Trump. What? How would you how would you assess both of them as media performers? And in particular, is why why is Trump such good media talent? See, I, I maybe look at it a bit differently because I always watch Trump through the lens of what if I had to interview this person? Because mm. that that's the way I often kind of have, have had to assess people. And I must admit that even though, you know, we would have obviously liked to land Trump, I was relieved to, that we did not land Trump in the era in which I was hosting 7.30 for a couple of reasons. One is because the volume of abuse that you get these days when mm. you land these big interviews is just absolutely off the charts and mm. I felt like I'd had a gut full of, you know, security threats and so forth. Um, and the other is those kind of people like Trump are very, very difficult to interview. You'll remember the famous interview with Jonathan Swan and, mm. and Donald Trump. Mm. That was a really interesting watch. And I remember talking about it to one of my colleagues at the time to say, Jonathan interviewed Trump in a way that I don't know I would have gotten away with as a national broadcaster, which is he, he betrayed in his face, like, huh, what, mm. what are you talking about? Um, but He was a bit of a ham in that interview, actually. He, he, he was, but it was to great effect because he was kind of able to marry your reaction that you were thinking as a viewer. And also when Trump would say something outlandish, Rather than challenge it, Jonathan would kind of challenge it, but the way that he would challenge it would be to go, well, hang on, show me on this bit of paper, show me what you mean. And mm. so you kind of got this full, it was a brilliant interview because you just got this full kind of sense of, of you know, Trump's 
um, dynamic. But generally, I find those pe- kind of people extremely difficult to interview because of the fact that, as I said before, I'm someone who relies on reason and logic and fact. So when you're speaking, I'm listening to what you're saying and I'm trying to process it in a logical way mm. and respond in kind. So when I interview people who don't operate on that basis, so say, for example, like a Clive Palmer or a Bob Catter or someone like that who's mm. more Trumpy in their vibe, I find them very difficult. It's like swatting a fly. The flies landed here and you kind mm. of swat, but then the flies buzzed off over here. And so it, I find it extremely difficult to have a, a, a productive interview mm. with someone of that nature. And so I, when I watched Trump, I would often be watching it through that lens, but also I just would be, because I'd be trying to listen for the logic, I, mm. I find it a, a baffling word soup. So I actually don't find him particularly compelling myself but I think possibly what it comes down to is as you say the energy and also the use of words that have a great emotive impact and that resonate and so there might it might be a whole word soup but then also he'll use the word say unfair all the time and people feel like things are unfair because they feel like they're they're doing it tough I'm reminded as well of my late father who once said something to me about Kevin Rudd Um, he said I don't, that guy must be really smart because I don't understand anything that he's saying because my father wasn't an educated man. And I just wonder sometimes if people kind of have that vibe as well. Like, I don't understand everything he's saying, but I like the guy. I did get what he was saying there about the unfairness. So maybe the rest of it, he's like president level, he's a successful businessman. Maybe I just don't understand the full extent of what he's saying. We're talking about interviews. You said you don't like those interviews where you're swatting, where you have, where you're swatting a fly. What are the interviews you really enjoy then? I really love it if the other person, if, if you're like bowling the ball at them and they're batting it back mm. or, or it's like a tennis game, actually tennis would be a better analogy. You're hitting it and it's a good rally and mm. it's going back and forth. And so I enjoy, I always used to love when I was at late line, some of the interviews we'd do there, cause you'd get these, you'd have time firstly, and you'd get these top shelf. I'm thinking of some of the Brits, like British thinkers. Mm. So um, John Micklethwaite, who used to edit The Economist, I think mm-hmm. Bloomberg now was one of my favourites. Simon Sharma, um, you know, obviously Christopher Hitchens, Matthew Paris. Um, these guys who, they've had those kind of top flight British educations where they can illustrate things using history, pop culture, mm. regular culture, um, the, the current events. And so they're just gigantic gigantically engaging Mm. and so those are the kind of interviews I like the best where it's actually an engaging conversation Mm. Mm. the ones I like least are where the person has a set kind of spin or line that they're sticking to and they're kind of just reciting it like an automaton no matter Mm. what you say all right and when what did you can what do you when you sit back and think about all these great and good people that you interviewed. Yeah. What sort of conclusions do you draw in general? I mean, do you find, I mean, these are extremely powerful, influential people. I mean, in general, when they entered the room, did the did the temperature change? <laughs> did you feel that they were sort of supermen and superwomen or did you often sit there feel, thinking, actually, if you didn't tell me, if I didn't know that this person was a foreign minister or a president, I wouldn't have guessed it. No. Usually I think at that level, by the time someone's got to that level, they have a certain confidence and assuredness about themselves, um, whether whether it's warranted or not. So, And also just the level of fame, I think, of some of those people. They walk in and it does kind of change the energy in the room. So Hillary Clinton walks in or mm. Tony Blair walks in. Like it does you know, everyone in the room knows who they are. It does definitely alter um, the vibe in the room. Um, I do think probably, I mean, you form your personal views, of course, of all of them. And that was one of the great pleasures of, and is of what I've chosen as a career is that I got to meet and and talk to a lot of people one-on-one and not filtered by having to watch them through something else. So you see the way they interact with the camera crew or Mm. the people around them or their own people and so Mm. forth, how they are when they're making small talk with you. And so you do form, um, you know, impressions of people and their professionalism or their charisma and Mm. so forth. Sometimes that's unexpected. I remember um, interviewing Renee Zellweger, the actress, Mm. and I wasn't really that interested in doing it. I I Mm. hadn't – nothing she'd ever been in had particularly won me over. And um, so for me, it was kind of just another day in the office, which I know sounds ridiculous, but it was. Um, and she walked into this room and 
it was honestly, it was like this beam of sunshine walked into the room. She was hilarious. She was warm. She just, everyone in the room within about one minute fell in love with her. It was like she just radiated light. And she, I thought to myself, Oh, I just saw why you're a movie star. Like mm. you, you, you have got so much charisma. It is just oozing mm. um, off you. Mm. And then other people kind of, you know, um, are more like what you'd expect, but then you see it up close. So say, for example, Bill Gates, um, he came in and I just, he was impossible to make small talk with. And I realised it's probably actually making it worse that I'm trying to make small talk. I think it would be better to just mm. give him his space and then we just start the interview and he'll talk about what he wants to talk about. Um, so, and then other people, you know, Hillary Clinton is quite chatty. Um, David Cameron, Tony Blair, that the polite Britishness, Boris Johnson, as you'd expect. I mean, who you've mm. also met, um, kind of shambolic and charming. Oh, Lee, hello. Oh, hello. You know, all of that. It, it, what you see is what you get sometimes, you know, with these people too. Mm. We, uh, one of the biggest interviews we did recently was with President Zelensky yeah. of, of Ukraine. We did that uh, in October 2022. And so, how did you find him? I haven't done him. Well, first of all, going into it, I had enormous respect for Zelensky's physical and moral courage in standing up to Vladimir Putin. I had already been blacklisted by the time I interviewed him by the Kremlin for saying <laughs> mean things about Putin. So <laughs> so maybe I was sort of um, inclined to like him anyway. Yeah, I it's thought he'd a, be living in exile in an apartment in Paris for sure. So full props to the guy. <laughs> yeah, no, ju just amazing. Uh, to your point, when, when we dealt with his staff in the lead up, they were all delightful, yeah. easy to deal with, despite the incredible pressure they mm. were under. Um, the thing I really remember is that um, Zelensky came on. He, he, we had a big screen. He was coming from Zoom uh, on, via Zoom from from the presidential palace in Kiev. We're having this conversation. It's it's hard to make too many personal connections with someone at a distance. But halfway through the conversation, he started to quote um, something that Angela Merkel had said to me. Uh, seven years earlier when oh. she was giving the Lowy lecture. Oh, so he'd done his homework. He'd done his homework. Right. And and afterwards I said, you know, to my colleagues, did we did we give him that Merkel quote? Because it was a perfect Merkel quote. Right. It was something she'd said about Russia. And we hadn't given it to them. And, and what I realised was that even though they had missiles falling around their heads, someone in a, in a bunker in Kiev is spending two hours on the Lowy Institute website mm. to get the perfect phrase to give to the boss for the weird interview he's doing with the Australian think tank. Mm. And I thought that is a level of professionalism and flair and tradecraft yeah. that you don't get often from the White House or oh. the Elysee Palace or the Lodge, but here you're getting it from a wartime leader who's making life and death decisions every single hour. Yeah, and understanding the... Um value of public opinion and yeah. that every person that you can reach who um, is going to form an opinion about you or what you're doing that you know it's important to do your homework on that I remember um the second time I interviewed Hillary Clinton this thing happened where she kind of arrived you know there's always like this huge entourage mm. around her she arrived and she said Lee it's so nice to see you again now tell me how's your baby I hear you're having a baby and I was just imagining it in the lift on the way down that someone probably said to her this is Lee Sales you met her in Melbourne three years yeah. ago she's had a baby and yeah. just giving it a quick sort yeah. of <laughs> it's the body person from Veep <laughs> yeah exactly that's right Gary quickly in the ear giving the um giving the information um but yeah that that's impressive doing the homework being done like that yeah all right let me come back to being – let me ask you one more question about foreign correspondence. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we can get news now from anywhere in the world via internet. You can tap the New York Times or the Washington Post or, yeah. or, the, or the, the Jakarta Post or whatever it is. Uh, and yet still, we, I certainly believe that there's value in having Australian foreign correspondents on the beat who look at – and who see a story through an Australian lens, who see Australian interests, who have an Australian sensibility or sense of humour. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that now? Because, of course, the ranks of Australian foreign correspondents are thinning a lot mm. less than they used to be 20 or 30 years ago. How important is it still to have Australian foreign corros on the beat? Yeah. What are the limitations too um, that foreign correspondents un operate under? Um, okay, I think it's important particularly in locations with which 
Australia has, um, you know, important links or interests, right? So mm -hmm. United States, mm -hmm. UK, in our own region um, and so forth. Um, I think that it, it, it's exactly as you said, those are the important reasons why, because you're putting an Australian lens on things. But say, for example, if you take AUKUS, um, if you read, say, the New York Times coverage of AUKUS, it's not going to necessarily tell you everything you want to know mm. from an Australian perspective because our national interest is not exactly the same as the United States' national mm. interest. So an Australian journalist is going to listen to a press conference about that or ask questions about that that are going to be different to what the Americans ask. So it's particularly when there's issues and stories where there's an Australian link that you want an Australian kind of take on it. But also even in terms of, say what's going on in the United States. Something I was always looking at was what's going on in the Australian news and what's happening here that might have some resonance mm. for back home. So, for example, I remember when I was there, Oregon was debating whether to introduce or legalise voluntary euthanasia. That obviously is a story that at the time had some resonance mm. for Australia as well. So you're looking for those kind of issues. The, the limitations are, firstly... Correspondents who stay in places for a long time, you start to view it as normal. You stop noticing the foreignness of it. Mm. And I think that's a risk because then things that should strike you as a story mm. don't necessarily strike you as a story and you're losing a bit of touch with what's going on back home. So you're a bit more disconnected from what your home audience wants as well. So I don't, I don't think people should be on postings for like, you know, hugely long periods of time. Having said that, you've got to be there long enough to understand the country and have mm. some contacts. The other issue, which is a major one somewhere like Washington, is access. Mm. Because an Australian correspondent in Washington, D.C. is just an absolute nobody. Mm. It's mm. like, you know, a, a local, you know, reporter mm. from... The middle of nowhere in Australia mm. shows up at the Canberra Press Gallery. They're not getting a look in compared right. to Phil Curry right. and Laura Tingle and so you, forth. You, won't, you wouldn't get a seat in the in the There's White no, House press no. room. You'd have to apply. If you wanted yep. to go to the White House, the Pentagon, whatever, you'd have to apply for permission mm. to go in. Um, and so it was hard to get access. It was hard to get people to return your calls. Members of Congress, why do they need to speak to, you know, No Votes TV, as my BBC colleague used to call us. <laughs> they, BBC had a hard time getting access. Yep. So if the BBC's not getting a look in... You know, ABC, really kind of struggling. So that's, that was a tricky thing to try to find ways to, you know, get around that. In fact, something I used to do actually, being here in a think tank, which is quite appropriate, at the time um, th there was a big story that I was on which was Guantanamo Bay because there was mm. a couple of Australians being held at Guantanamo Bay as part of the war on terror. And getting access to anyone who was kind of running it at the American end was really difficult because they were in the National Security Council, mid-ranked people in the Pentagon and so forth. But they're the kind of people that often show up at think tanks to talk. And so you could never kind of get past their secretary. You couldn't get onto them at, at work, but you could go to like a lunchtime thing at a think tank and jump in a lift with them at the end or grab mm. them at the end and ask for a coffee. So I used to keep an assiduous look on what was going on at Brookings and Heritage mm. and so forth so that I could go and just buttonhole people. We're happy to be of service. I'm Lee. glad. <laughs> um, let me ask you, let me come from overseas back to Australia and ask you uh, a question about how the Australian media is doing. You gave the Andrew Ollie lecture um, last year and you stuck your neck out. You made some strong arguments. Um, and one of them was that you were critical of some of your journalistic colleagues who were, who were starting to behave as much like activists as they were like journalists. So tell us a bit about that argument. So I just think that there is an increasing trend um, towards opinion creeping into journalism across media organisations. And the kind of where it comes from, I guess, is this idea of, well, you know, this is the truth and so we should stand up for the truth. Well, well actually your job as a journalist is not to determine necessarily what the truth is. It's to present all of the available information to the public and to say, you make up your own mind. That's not to say that you can't apply analytical tools like, you know, A plus B equals C, therefore D must be true or, mm, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, but it's not your job to start from a position of, well, I think this about this issue and therefore I'm going to, you know, do this in my reporting. And so I'm bothered by so many issues that this seems to have become a thing and that, you know, people quest question the value of, the basic tenets of journalism like impartiality, fairness and so on, setting aside your own opinion, um, th this argument towards, I guess, incorporating your lived experience into your work, mm. having a diversity of lived experience is super important um, in a newsroom because that helps you see 
stories that other people might mm. not spot. Mm. Um, but it doesn't mean that you should become, you know, mm. your opinion should become part of the story. And so I wanted to make this case, which in this day and age, it kind of alarms me that that's a controversial argument to make. It just seems ludicrous to me that that that's a question in journalism about whether you should park your opinions at the door. But nonetheless, that that's where the debate is. How does that link to social media? Because I, I notice you've kind of disengaged over the years from social media. You were a big user of Twitter when it started and yeah. then you sort of became a bit more distant and I think you, you jumped off it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Do you think other journalists should be on social media? Because social media is – it's hard to disguise your opinions if you're yeah. on social media a lot, isn't it? It's yeah. very tempting – yeah. To to disclose your opinions and to and to reach judgments and to broadcast judgments. I think the other thing people find hard to do is not to react to people. Like so someone says something that's mm. inflammatory to you about a report you've done mm. or something, you feel the need to react. And so you see people getting into trouble with that. Look, I always right from the start my my friend, the late Mark Colvin, who, mm. you know, was your friend as well, um, we used to talk about this a lot because he was a very active Twitter user too. And so we, we always had in our own mind very strong thoughts about, you know, you don't weigh in on stories that you're covering or generally on any story really because it undermines your credibility. You've got to be careful of your behaviour because it influences as well the way people think of you, your authority and so forth. Mark was fantastic at just, you know, what I loved about Twitter in the early days was was what Mark was doing with it, which was, he, he read so widely that he'd post so many mm. different things that I wouldn't otherwise have seen if not for Mark drawing my attention to them. But over time, it turned into kind of less of an interesting conversation and more of a just people having pot shots at each other. So uh, over time, I ended up using it as kind of a one-way marketing tool to say, this is what's on 7.30 tonight or here's my latest book or whatever. <laughs> and then in the end, even the utility of that was kind of mm. limited. So, um, yeah, I, I jumped off it. But I do, I do think... You know, it, it certainly made me think less of some journalists seeing their kind of opinions out there constantly and I think people should be very, mm. you know, very careful about that. And also just to keep in mind, like, who, who do you think needs to hear your opinion? Who do you think cares, <laughs> you know? I just find that tricky sometimes too. Like, why do you think we need hot take 151 on, you know, XYZ story? It's mm. just, yeah, go and go and do some stories. So, so now that you're not a, a, uh, a young foreign correspondent in Washington but you're a sort of eminence grise <laughs> of, of um, the Australian media world, when you squint your eyes, do you think that the Australian media has got better or worse in the period that you've been working in it? A bit of both. Um, I'm super cautious as well about I don't I never want to be one of those people who's like, oh, back in the day when I was a youngster, we used to have to go out and do three stories a day, you know, like all that kind of nonsense. It just makes <laughs> you roll your eyes. Um, certainly, obviously, the gender balance has improved gigantically yeah. over the time, um, you know, that I've I've worked in newsrooms. There's much, much more, um, you know, recognition of, of that. Um, and, and just general understanding too of the importance of diversity um, in, in newsrooms. I'd like to see more class diversity um, and people understanding the need mm -hmm. that a lot of people come into it now who've gotten gone through university and so forth, whereas 30, 40, 50 years ago people were coming in, they'd leave school in grade 10, come in and be a copy boy or a copy girl and then mm. work their way up. And that means you, you got a different cohort mm. of people through, you know, mm -hmm. people that came from working class backgrounds rather than, you know, mum's a dad, doctor's a lawyer and I went to a mm -hmm. elite Sydney private school. Ideological um, diversity as well? Yeah, and I think that partly comes from the economic diversity mm. um, too. But there's certainly been a much better recognition of the need for diversity. There's still a way to go in that, but it's definitely – improved gigantically um, and then I think the so I think there's some positives in that kind of sense what, one of the major positives has been just technology and what you can do with technology I mm. mean it's just absolutely gobsmacking even mm. the fact that we can be sitting here mm. in a location filming something if we wanted to this could actually be going out live right mm. now from here mm. um, it could be going out live to the other side of the world like mm. I, I remember covering Hurricane Katrina and there was this moment where I just felt like, oh, my God, which was a technological game changer, which was I had this great American producer who was really great with all the latest gadgets. Mm. We had been in New Orleans airport where they were evacuating people. It was this just absolute disaster. And normally in this era when you were filing, you'd have to find a place with a landline telephone, you'd pull the cables out, you'd plug other cables into your phone, into the, into the phone jack, and then you would hear the sort of... <laughs> 
noise and then you would watch it as it sent and took an hour to send like two minutes of audio. Mm. You couldn't really get television vision out like that. And Jason, um, we're sitting on the median strip outside the airport and Jason has brought this wireless dongle and he, he said, I've got this Wi-Fi and he put it into the side of the laptop and we sat there, edited our story digitally on the laptop and then sent it whoosh, mm. off it went and I remember just thinking this is unbelievable that we mm. just could get that audio on our digital recorders into the laptop and it's back mm. no need to be anywhere near a phone line mm. and so and then you think that that sounds primitive now me explaining mm. that compared to what we can actually yeah. do now yeah I mean I was broadcasting out of my own bedroom alone during yeah. COVID for some yeah. episodes of 7 30. Well also in the think tank world uh, it, what you say reminds me of something Owen Harry's a, a mutual friend of ours once told me which was that uh, when he was when he wrote, was first writing for foreign affairs, he was an academic at the University of New South Wales, and he would write the, he would type this article, send it to New York, and like three months later, he'd get a letter oh. saying, "Professor Harris, we've decided to, to to publish your article." Whereas now, as people as as professionals who interact with the media, we can have constant discussions and emails. You can be you can be publishing things. Um, you, it makes it much more feasible to be to to be an international analyst while you're living in Australia. Or you're producing your own content. So mm. say, for example, in the early years of the Lowy Institute, to mm. my great benefit, mm. when you had great people coming through, you'd mm. ring me and go, well, David Petraeus is coming. Mm. Do you want to interview him on 7.30 mm. or whatever? Um, Boris Johnson's here. Do you want him for 7.30? Yep, mm. great. Thanks, Michael. Well, now mm. you... You do it yourself. Mm. You don't need to go and mm. put them, you know, elsewhere. You you can produce your own content. Mm. And so I think that's been an incredible development for, I guess, the democratisation of the mm. media. Right. And then, you know, all my concerns are all the things I outlined before, just the lack of impartiality and opinion and, um, you know, inaccuracy and bias and you know all that all that kind of stuff which you know I, I, I do worry I'm on the sinking ship adhering to those views. Um, I hope I'm not but Look, who knows? I've had a good run and if, if it changes and new generations coming through have a different view of journalism, well, that's that's fine. All right, let me finish with a couple of final questions. First of all, uh, given this is an international podcast, I know you you love watching world affairs. What are the what are the biggest, most important sources of international news for you? What do you log on? Are there particular blogs that you think other people should look at or, or magazines or what? So I do tend to shift a little bit from time to time. So for, for example, at the moment, because it's a US um, election year, I've got a few podcasts that I dip in and out of, mostly the New York Times ones about American mm -hmm. politics. And I'll tend to, I don't listen all the time, but I'll tend to think, oh, okay, well, it's, you know, Super Tuesday, so I'll whack that on this week and have a listen and then it, I can kind of catch up and I can do something else while I'm doing it. Um, I subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post. I would say probably though my preferred American media at the moment is The Atlantic. I think The Atlantic mm. is doing really good work. I think they've kind of shifted into the terrain that, you know, as I was saying to you that I kind of support, which is curious questioning journalism that's mm. kind of – chief motivation is curiosity and, and the facts, not ideology. Um, I think they do some fantastic work. So I, I my pr if I could only read one thing every day, I'd go to The Atlantic. I've always rated The Economist. Um, I I tend, that, that would be probably the, they would be the things that I mostly go to, I think for, um, oh, the BBC website, I, mm. I glance at CNN, mm. I glance at, um, and then that's about it. And then I skim all of the Australian mm. news websites as well. But generally, I would not read my foreign news on the Australian websites. I'd go mm. to the um, overseas mm. websites. And I think my own bias, if you had someone here who'd been a London correspondent, I bet you they'd rattle through, I read the Times. and mm. So my bias is just towards the American publications. Yeah. And what about fiction and TV and movies and stuff like that about politics and foreign policy and spooks? Um, so, I mean, I love all of that stuff. I, for anyone that didn't watch The Bureau, which was a French mm. television um, show about their foreign intelligence agency, that was so, so good. I could not have loved it anymore. It's, I'm not sure if it's all still on SBS. It was on SBS On Demand. Um, and in a similar vein, I loved a, a show called The Americans. Did you end up watching that? No. Oh, Michael! How many times have I told you to watch it? The Americans, which was about, it's set in the 1980s in Washington and it's about these two Russian agents living in deep cover in suburban Washington. Mm. Uh, it was it was really fantastic too. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, I take your recommendations with a handful of salt, to be honest. So. <laughs> um, yeah, they're my they're my two favourites of recent times. I'd say I just did watch actually Scoop, which is the thing about securing the interview oh, with yeah. Prince, Prince uh, Newsnight securing the interview with yeah, Prince where Andrew. the producer is is the is the star, not the host. The producer's always the star, yeah. Mark, the real star. Um, I, I probably haven't seen a television show that captured so accurately what the nature of my job as an anchor used to be like it's really accurate except I didn't get the memo about spawning around in the office with a designer dog the entire time which they portray Emily Maitlis as, as doing mm. which I asked a mate at the BBC did she really have that dog with her the entire time and they were like she had it occasionally they've taken a few mm. liberties there but just the kind of um for anyone who watches that the way the team works on the interview, lands the interview and then works on what are we going to mm. ask and the way they're schmoozing Prince Andrew and his press sec- his private secretary, that that was all very, very true to what it's what it's really like. Mm. Well, just to do the other side of the sales, Fully Love Book Club, I've been, <laughs> yes. I've been recommending to you for many years Slow Horses know, and you've yeah. ignored that recommendation. <laughs> yeah, I know. Both the books and the, and, and the TV show are brilliant. But the other one, uh, as you know, I'm writing a book on JFK yeah. at the moment. And um, a couple of years ago, Fred Logval, who's a historian at Harvard, wrote this absolutely magnificent um, biography uh, just called JFK Volume 1 um, about Kennedy's early life, which is an incredible read but also makes a pretty compelling argument that Kennedy is a more substantial figure than um, many people have um, mistaken him for. So I recommend that. I find this fascinating because, and admire, you know, because you you also did an FDR book. Mm. These these giant figures, you sometimes feel like, or I should say one sometimes feels like, um, is there possibly anything more to say about JFK or about FDR? And what's kind of exhilarating is when someone writes a take where you go, Oh God, that's that's fantastic! I hadn't mm. you know thought about it. like remember my friend Julia Baird writing a book about Queen Victoria, mm. and I was just thinking, what new can there possibly be to add on this person? But there is. Mm. And I also find that that it's such an effort, as you know, as a as you've written many books, it's such a big effort. You have to have oh. a person that you're you find appealing and attractive. You have to have a big big story. Yeah. And again, to go back to Owen Harry's, who who was a mentor of mine, I remember Owen once giving me some advice, and that is, Michael, if you're ever going swimming, swim in the deep waters, not in the shallows. Yeah. And so it's better to take on a huge topic or a big figure like a very important president, and and try to try to come at try to give that a new uh, try try to come at that from a new angle rather than taking some sort of obscure figure on the margins. Well, because you're going to be living with them for a long time, yeah. and and generally even someone that you like or admire or, or whatever, by the end of the process, you're going to be over it because it's a lot of work to kind of write a book. So if you're starting from a premise of ah, oh, I hope they're going to sustain it, or this is a bit interesting, but I'm not sure about the whole thing. It's it's you're going to struggle. So it, it's good advice, unsurprisingly, from from the great Owen Harris. Lee Sales, I've really enjoyed speaking with you today. We've done the book recommendations, um, so we'll have nothing to discuss over lunch. <laughs> um, but you've been a very gracious host. You've, you've done your own sound effects on the modem. You've, you've talked about <laughs> swatting flies. Um, you've given us some of your tricks, like jumping into elevators at think tanks, pursuing mid-level <laughs> officials. So you're giving away your secrets. I put, some, I put some makeup on. I made an effort to look nice for you. It's, yeah, it's all... It's all it's all I've, I've done my homework like Zelensky. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us for this episode of The Director's Chair. Thank you very much for inviting me. The Director's Chair is a podcast from the Lowy Institute. The producers for this episode were Josh Godding and Andrew Griffiths. David Valance provided research assistance. If you've jo- enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app and you can find all our past episodes at our website, lowyinstitute.org slash directorschair. I'm Michael Fullylove. Thank you for listening.